won't believe what happened to this man when his wife almost caught him cheating. 23-year-old Kevin Nascimento, also known as MC Kevin, was a Brazilian famous singer who got married in 2021 to Diolaine Bezerra. But only two weeks after their wedding, Kevin and his friend made arrangements for them to meet this model named Bianca Dominguez in a hotel room. Apparently, Kevin was staying in room 1302 with his wife, but later made his way to room 502 to meet Bianca. And I'm sure you know what went down in that hotel room. So while this was going on, Kevin suddenly realized that his wife was looking for him. And in a panic, Kevin ran out onto the balcony and tried to climb his way into the balcony below him to hide from his wife. Unfortunately, Kevin slipped and fell five stories. He was found by staff and was rushed to the hospital, but on his way there, he passed away. I was just supposed to take an Uber, but I got into the wrong vehicle, which tragically changed the course of my life. My name is Samantha Josephson, and I was 21 years old. On March 29, 2019, while celebrating the end of my university studies at a bar with friends, I decided to order an Uber to go home. While waiting for my driver, a car approached me and, without hesitation, I climbed aboard. Unfortunately, it turned out not to be my Uber, but the car of a man named Nathaniel Rowland. He had watched me a few minutes earlier as I waited. Roland had locked the rear doors, leaving me trapped. He drove me not far from his home and, while I was still in the car, stabbed me over a hundred times. The next day, my flatmates, worried about my absence, reported me missing. My body was discovered in a field 14 hours after my abduction. Nathaniel Roland was sentenced to life imprisonment. Send this TikTok to a friend so she can pay attention. What do you think of my story? These are videos humans were never meant to see. Okay, so we all speak English, right? Well, have you ever wondered what English sounds like to somebody that doesn't speak it? Well, in this video, I'm about to show you and it's kind of crazy. So without further ado, here's what English sounds like to people who don't speak it. It's alright to go up around the wash today. Oh? Yeah, that doll's a ring on her face. Can't breathe that more helping John. Did you stop by the love call? Yeah, I come by the men's room. I played that private by the wrong front line today. Oh, the raising man with an ash marine? That for me, you great that treason. No, her station is trapped. I mean, why the crest soldier for the Magdalene Nation? It's further grounds to my chosen. Chosen for the Magdalene? Magdalene, my shit. <laughs> So yeah, is that what we really sound like to other people? If so, I might have to learn a different language. This pregnant teenager vanished the day before giving birth. Now her and her boyfriend are dead. Savannah Soto was an 18-year-old due to give birth. The girl from Texas had an appointment scheduled to induce her labor. However, her family were really concerned when she didn't turn up to that appointment. Her boyfriend, Matthew Guerra, was 23 years old. The pair lived together and Savannah was last seen on the 22nd of December near her home. Her mum tried to show up to the house to see what was going on, but when she knocked, there was no reply. On the 26th of December, the pair were found dead in a car in San Antonio. An unborn baby was also tragically found dead at the scene. They'd been shot and police believe that the bodies may have been there for a couple of days. Police are now on the hunt for the killer or killers. There is some CCTV footage. It captured the car that the couple were found in as well as a dark colored pickup truck. Heartbreakingly, it isn't the first time that the family has had to deal with unspeakable tragedy. In 2022, Savannah's 15 year old brother, Ethan, was shot and killed. Police are appealing to the public for help in identifying the individuals in the CCTV footage. They hope this may shed some light on who the killer or killers are. What in the world is this? A laser weapon was shot from the sky and it has the whole world panicking. Is it aliens or just some advanced technology we don't know anything about? Okay, so this only happened a couple weeks ago on May 26th in Chile. A man was in his apartment when he heard five large explosions and his power went out. That's when he started recording and captured this video. And it's literally a laser beam shot from the sky. 
There was only a couple things this could be, one of them being government testing, another being an advanced piece of technology the public has no idea about, or the third being aliens. I honestly have no idea and I'm completely mind blown. Let me know your opinions on this because I'm extremely curious. What happened to this missing little boy? In 1991, 11 year old Mark Heimbau was living on the Jersey Shore. On November the 25th, a fire broke out near the beach and he was curious to take a look. After leaving his house to explore, he was never seen again. Now, investigators thought that he may have drowned or be stuck somewhere. Local volunteers, helicopter crews and dog units all set out scouring the local area. Then they had a breakthrough. A fireman found one of his trainers on the beach. At this point, Mark's mom started getting really excited that they may be able to find him. However, unfortunately, this was not the case. Disturbingly, witnesses also reported seeing a man talking to him. Thomas Buckcavage Jr. was a 57-year-old man who police questioned. He allegedly looked like a sketch of the man that Mark was seen talking to. Now, he was actually sentenced to 18 to 36 years in prison after being convicted of essaying young boys. He is still in prison, but he denies any knowledge of this little boy. Police are now hoping that new AI technology can help shed new light on the case. My dad punished me by putting me in the washing machine, and I died instantly, being only three years old. My name is Bastien Champenois and I am from France. My parents were often very violent with me, but due to my young age, I didn't really understand what they were doing to me. On November 25, 2011, just after I returned from school, I took a drawing I had made in class and then threw it in the trash. My father, Christophe Champenois, judged that this was inappropriate behavior and that I shouldn't have thrown it away. To punish me, he violently grabbed me and put me in the washing machine. Then he closed the door and started a program. And he went to his computer while the washing machine program was running. My older sister, who was five years old at that time, saw everything but couldn't do anything. As soon as the machine was finished, he took me out of the washing machine. But I was already dead. My father was then sentenced to 30 years of criminal imprisonment for killing me. This case greatly shocked the media, especially since my parents were already known to social services due to numerous reports that had been made in the past, but nothing was done against them. This has to be one of the creepiest mugshots I've ever seen, and the story behind it is pretty disturbing. This is the man in the mugshot, Christopher Queen. At the time of his arrest, he was 48 years old and living in Pennsylvania. So on election day in 2018, Christopher entered a polling center in Pennsylvania planning on casting a vote. But when he arrived to vote, he was told that he couldn't because he wasn't registered. Poll workers who were working that day even stated that they heard Christopher mention that he was getting paid $100 to come vote, which obviously was not true. But when Christopher arrived, like I said before, he wasn't registered to vote in Washington County, the county he was in. When the workers told him that he couldn't vote, they noticed that Christopher began to shake uncontrollably and became filled with some sort of a rage. He then made the verbal threat that he was going to come back and shoot up the place, and after that, he was quickly put into handcuffs. I don't know the full story behind why he chose to exhibit this expression in his mugshot, but they caught him before he could enact any sort of violence, and yeah, he was arrested. It's worth noting as well that in other news reports that surfaced after this threat was made, Christopher is seen smiling in the same type of manner. Luckily though, authorities were able to arrest Christopher and put him in custody that day before he could cause any violence. I miraculously survived three days.
of this shipwreck. These are apex predators through the ages, part one. Up first is Mosasaurus. They dominated the oceans from 82 to 66 million years ago, and they could grow up to 17 meters in length, which if you don't know is 55 feet long. I'm just happy I wasn't in the ocean when this thing was around. Next up is Titanoboa. And if you hate snakes, you're gonna hate Titanoboa. After the extinction of dinosaurs, another huge reptile gained foothold, which was Titanoboa. Growing up to 45 feet long, Titanoboa was the largest snake that ever lived. And what do you think you're gonna do if this thing just starts slithering at you full speed? Next up are terror birds. I feel like this is a creature not many people heard of. And these were birds who were flightless and carnivores. And they had curved beaks designed for tearing flesh. They existed for 60 million years and went extinct 1.8 million years ago. This is definitely one of the most dangerous birds to ever live on Earth. Finally is Andrew Sarkis's. Based on the size of its skull, Andrew Sarkis is believed to have been the largest terrestrial mammal carnivore on Earth. They lived 41 million years ago and are actually closer related to whales than wolves. It's crazy how many creatures came and gone on this planet that we call home. I took the lives of my two daughters to get back at my ex-husband. I'm Veronica Youngblood, originally from Argentina, where I experienced constant physical violence. After giving birth to a daughter when I was a teenager, I worked as a lady of the night to support her. In 2007, I met Ron Youngblood, a Navy pilot, and we married, later moving to the United States with our two daughters. However, our relationship took a difficult turn, culminating in our divorce a year later. Ron was a loving father to both our daughters, even though the eldest was not biologically his. After the divorce, I used my children to manipulate Ron until he announced he was moving to another city for work. Unable to continue manipulating the situation through my daughters, I became deeply frustrated. Unable to accept this reality, I planned to cause Ron as much pain as possible before he left. During a family evening, I made the tragic decision to shoot my daughters resulting in the instant death of the youngest. I then contacted Ron to inform him of this terrible act, but I had failed to take the life of the eldest. The surviving daughter alerted the police, who quickly intervened. I was arrested and sentenced to 78 years in prison. Unfortunately, the eldest daughter died shortly afterwards. These are pictures that'll make you feel uneasy, part three. Up first is a picture of all the blood vessels in your head. This is absolutely weird to look at, especially because this is what the underneath of our skin looks like. Just imagine if humans walked around looking like this 24-7. Next up, we all know sharks are already terrifying, but this is a picture showing the bottom of a shark, and it gives a whole new meaning to terrifying. This picture just made me 10 times more scared of sharks because why do they have this creepy face underneath them? Next up is a picture of a beehive built on a statue's head. Now, this looks like some sort of creature out of an alien movie, and that's what makes it so unsettling. Just imagine walking through the woods and seeing this. You'll think it's some sort of extraterrestrial creature. Next up is a picture of an abandoned hospital with a random light on on one of the top floors. Nobody has been in this building for years, and to this day, no one has any clue of what this light was or who caused it. Next are tree roots that look exactly like a human being. Just imagine walking through the woods and seeing this on the ground. I would instantly think it's a human. Finally, these two friends were driving down a dark, lonely road one night when they suddenly came across this. It's planks with a bunch of nails on them. Whoever put this on the road definitely has sinister plans for whoever hits it. And luckily, these two friends turned around immediately. The death of Bob Saget was completely unexpected and pretty mysterious, so let's talk about it. So if you don't know Bob Saget, then you probably haven't ever watched the show Full House. Full House was the show that really launched Bob Saget's career, along with the careers of people like John Stamos. And Bob Saget also went on to host America's Funniest Home Videos. He was a very beloved figure in Hollywood and in American culture, but one day in 2022, the completely unexpected happened. At around 4 p.m. on January 9th, 2022, Bob Saget was found dead in his hotel room. These are real pictures released by the police of Bob Saget's hotel room after they found his body. At the time of his death, Bob Saget was in Orange County, Florida. He was on a tour doing stand-up comedy and had just played a show the night before. On February 9th, the autopsy report was released which stated that Bob Saget had died from blunt force trauma to the back of the head. 
Now, usually you hear of blunt force trauma causing a death in the case of murder cases. But according to authorities and the official story, Bob Saget supposedly fell somewhere in this hotel room, hit his head on the back of the head, crawled into bed, and died in his sleep. Now, I don't really know what to think of all of this. I think it probably was some sort of a tragic incident. But regardless, this was an extremely shocking death, and once again, it is somewhat mysterious. These are active serial killers who haven't been caught yet, part one. Up first is the I-70 killer. The I-70 killer is an unidentified American man who killed six store clerks across the Midwest in 1992. Victims were typically young women who were petite and brunette. The one male victim had long brown hair which he often wore in a ponytail. So it is theorized that this killer mistook him for a woman from a distance. Also the I-70 killer is suspected to be behind two more murders in 1993, an attempted murder in 1994 and one more in 2001. His only surviving victim is 35-year-old Vicky Webb. She briefly talked to him before he shot her, but he just left her there for dead, and the bullet didn't properly penetrate her, and she survived. Next up is the Long Island Serial Killer, also known as the Craigslist Ripper. This person is believed to be active from 1996 to 2010. Authorities came to this conclusion after 10 bodies were found on the Long Island coast between 2010 and 2011. There are eight other potential victims, some of whom have never been identified. Most of the victims were known to sell adult services on Craigslist. And several people have been suspected of being the Long Island serial killer. Like this man, John Bitrolf. He has been charged with two confirmed murders, but is suspected for another 15 to 20, making him the number one suspect of being the Long Island serial killer. This man used a moose antler to kill a child abuser. This is one of the most bizarre true crime cases of 2023. In March last year, a shocking situation unfolded. 27-year-old Levi Axtell walked into a police station covered in blood. The man from Minnesota admitted to police to a hideous crime. Now, years earlier, back in 2018, Levi had made some serious claims to the court. He had a 22-month-old daughter at the time and was suspicious of one of his neighbours. This was an elderly man named Lawrence Scully. In his letter, he wrote, he has been at the daycare many times stalking children in his van. He is a convicted P and him stalking and attempting to groom my daughter is completely inappropriate and needs to stop. Now, initially the court did grant protection for a period of time. However, this was dismissed just weeks later. By March, 2023, Levi decided to take matters into his own hands. He had reportedly seen Lawrence parking at locations where children were likely to be, and he feared this was intentional. Intoxicated, he drove to Lawrence's home and attacked him with a shovel. He hit him between 15 and 20 times and then attacked him with a large moose antler. The man who had previously been convicted for essaying a six-year-old girl was killed. Levi admitted to the killing and stated that he views himself as a hero. He's been deemed currently not fit to stand trial and a psychologist wrote in support of keeping him in a secure mental health facility. This is the scariest story about the lights and I promise you would never want to be home alone again. There was a young woman named Ava home alone one night doing the dishes and it was around 9 p.m. and after she finished she was planning on going to bed. Ava finished the last dish and turned off the light and went upstairs. But suddenly as she was walking up the stairs she noticed the light was back on in the kitchen. She could have sworn she turned it off, but she went back over and turned it off again. She then went back up the stairs, but again she noticed the light was back on. Ava was now scared. She then tiptoed down the stairs and looked around, but nobody was there. She then quickly ran over to the light and turned it off, then turned around and walked back towards the stairs. When suddenly the light turned back on and a man's voice said, Stop, in a very sinister tone. Ava turned around shaking with fear and looked at the man. He was holding a knife and smiling. Ava then said, what do you want, in a shaky tone. The man looked at her and said, you. He then jumped at Ava, grabbing her by the throat. Ava tried to resist, but it was no use. The man then threw her to the ground and began stabbing her repeatedly. Ava's body was discovered two days later by a friend who went over to check on her after not answering her phone for two days. She was missing three fingers and she was stabbed 12 times. Cops looked for the man, but after months of no clues or leads, they began to lose hope. The scary part is, the man who did this is most likely still out there, and doing the same things to others that he did to Ava.
Search for these two missing girls on Monday ended with finding seven bodies on a remote Oklahoma property. This is what we know so far. These are the seven people who were found shot to death on the Henrietta property. The property was rented by 39-year-old Jesse McFadden, who was a convicted sex offender. He lived there with his wife Holly and her three teenage kids, Riley, Michael, and Tiffany. Jesse reportedly hid his criminal history from his family and friends until recent months, and he was described as standoffish and extremely controlling, keeping his family under lock and key. He was on the Oklahoma State Sex Offender Registry after being convicted of first-degree rape back in 2003. He was released from prison in late 2020, which I honestly can't believe, because while he was serving that sentence, he was using a contraband cell phone to send nude photos and videos of himself to a 16-year-old girl. But nonetheless, he was released anyway. Over the weekend, two of Tiffany's best friends, 14-year-old Ivy Webster and 16-year-old Brittany Brewer, were over at the family's home having a slumber party, which was pretty regular for them. An Amber Alert was issued when they didn't return home late Sunday evening. The following day, Jesse had a scheduled court hearing for charges of soliciting sexual conduct with a minor and for possession of CSAM, which he failed to show up to. Subsequently, a warrant was issued for his arrest, and when executing a search warrant, authorities found the bodies of all seven people on the property, including Jesse himself. According to authorities, the bodies were not found in the residence, but in separate locations on the property. They were all shot between one and three times in the head and appeared to be running away from Jesse, who shot and killed all of them before turning the gun on himself. Not many details have been released, including what the motive may have been, but this was a completely shocking and senseless tragedy. It makes me wonder why Jesse was ever let out of prison in the first place. I've attached the GoFundMes for Ivy and Britney's families in my bio if you'd like to help them during this difficult time. This man watched amputation videos and then did the unthinkable to a young woman. During lockdown 2020, 32-year-old Lorraine Cox was living with her fiancé in Scotland. Like loads of people who were separated from family and friends during the restrictions, she decided to reconnect with them when the restrictions eased. She moved back down to Exeter and her friends were excited to see her. She'd been out socialising at one evening and in the early hours of the 21st of September 2020, she was heading home from a night out. She was captured on CCTV with a man, 24-year-old Azam Mangori. To glance at the image, you may think he was a friend or someone she knew, but he'd actually stalked her for a mile before going up to her and luring her back to his flat. These would be the last pictures of Lorraine alive. When she vanished without any contact with friends and family, they began to share missing persons posters to try and get in contact with her. However, during the search, they found that she'd posted something strange on Facebook. The post stated that she had moved to Plymouth, which they just knew didn't sound like her at all. She was diabetic and she hadn't taken any of her medication. When police discovered the CCTV, Azam continued to change his story. He also gave them a fake name and claimed to be homeless. When police searched the area, they found something shocking. In a nearby alley, Lorraine's dismembered body parts were found in a bin bag. The rest of her body parts weren't found for another four days. Police discovered that Lorraine's deceased body has been in Azam's flat for an entire week prior to him deciding to dispose of it. Now, he denied premeditation and said he dismembered her in a panic. However, police found on his search history that he'd been watching amputation videos days prior to her death. He was sentenced to life with a minimum of 20 years. This is Abby Choi, a 28-year-old model and influencer in Hong Kong who was murdered and dismembered last month. According to authorities, her head and several of her body parts were found inside a pot of cooked soup. This is what we know so far. Abby is a mom of four and a known fashion icon and influencer in Hong Kong. She was reported missing on February 21st after failing to pick her daughter up from school, which she did daily. She was last seen getting into a car driven by her ex-brother-in-law named Anthony, who she hired as her driver. A massive search was launched, and three days later, some of Abby's dismembered body parts were found inside of a rental unit in a suburb of Hong Kong. Some body parts were reportedly hidden inside of a fridge, while others were cooked. And her head and some of her ribs were found inside a pot of cooked soup. Also found at the crime scene was a meat slicer and an electric saw. A total of seven suspects would soon be arrested for her murder, including her ex-husband Alex, his parents Kwong and Jenny, her ex-brother-in-law Anthony, an alleged mistress of Kwong's, a friend of Alex's, and a 41-year-old man named Lam Shun. Abby's ex-husband Alex was arrested after trying to flee Hong Kong by boat. Her murder was reportedly planned by her ex-father-in-law Kwong, who was a former police officer accused of sexual assault. According to authorities, the motive was over a money dispute and a luxury apartment recently purchased by Abby. Alex, Anthony, and Kwong were charged with murder, while Jenny was charged with destroying evidence. They are all being held without bail. Lam was charged with aiding and abetting Alex to escape by boat, as he was an employee of a yacht rental company. The two others were charged with hiding Alex before his attempted escape. However, they were released on bail. They are due back in court on May 8, 2023.
Authorities in Hong Kong are still searching local landfills for Abby's remaining body parts, including her hands and torso. This woman murdered her friend when she believed an online catfish would pay her $9 million. 22-year-old Denali Bremer and 19-year-old Cynthia Hoffman met in school and became close friends. Cynthia was a sweet girl who had a learning disability, which meant that her mental age was much younger than her actual age. In 2019, Denali was 18 years old and had begun an online relationship with a guy called Tyler. This Tyler claimed to be a millionaire who lived in Kansas. Bizarrely, the couple would conspire to commit crimes to make money. One of the plans included SAing someone in Alaska and then killing them. Disturbingly, one day, Tyler requested photos from Denali showing her murdering someone. He promised to give her $9 million in exchange for sickening images. Denali agreed to this plan and began planning to murder her friend Cynthia. She enlisted four friends, 16-year-old Caden McIntosh, Caleb Leyland, and two others who had been kept anonymous due to their age. She promised them a cut of the money once the plan had been carried out. In June that year, Denali and Caden lured unsuspecting Cynthia to Thunderbird Falls Creek in the pretense of going hiking. They then bound Cynthia's hands and feet and covered her mouth with duct tape. They then shot her in the back of the head and pushed her into the river. Denali took photos of the entire thing, which she then sent to Tyler. The friends disposed of Cynthia's personal belongings and then told her parents that they had dropped her off at the park. Cynthia's body was discovered two days later after she was reported missing. During police investigations, it transpired that Tyler wasn't a millionaire or even called Tyler. He was Darren Schillmiller from Indiana. Darren, Caleb and Caden are pleading not guilty to charges of murder and are awaiting trial. Denali was arrested and she is pleading guilty to first degree murder. She faces up to 99 years in prison. Ethan Millard was on a business trip in Baton Rouge, Louisiana when he disappeared on February 23rd, but his body was just found. This is everything we know so far. Nathan is a husband and father of five from Georgia who went on what was supposed to be a quick business trip to Baton Rouge last month. On the day he disappeared, he went to a basketball game and then to Happy's Irish Pub in the downtown area, reportedly with a client. He was seen leaving the pub at around 10.30 p.m. after being cut off by a bartender. The last known footage of Nathan comes from a nearby business at around 4.30 in the morning where he appears to be walking down a busy road with an unknown person. The two are walking towards Interstate 10, just a few blocks away from a Greyhound bus station. It's assumed that Nathan was walking back to the Courtyard Marriott where he was staying, which wasn't that far away. But he disappeared before making it back to the hotel. Just hours before being reported missing, Nathan was physically seen at the Greyhound bus station by a security guard who thought he looked out of place, but when he offered to get him a ride back to the hotel, Nathan reportedly declined and left. He was then reported missing early the next morning after missing a scheduled work meeting. During the search, Nathan's phone was found not far from the hotel, and authorities discovered surveillance footage showing an unknown individual using Nathan's debit card multiple times after he disappeared. But on March 6, at around 3.30 in the morning, authorities received a phone call from someone claiming to smell a foul odor near an abandoned funeral home as they were driving by. Upon searching the area, they found Nathan's body. He had been rolled up in carpet and covered in plastic. The area in which his body was found was in the 2900 block of Scenic Highway, less than two miles of that Greyhound bus station. At this point, his cause of death is still unknown pending further testing, but according to authorities, they stated that there was no evidence of internal or external trauma to his body. They also stated that it seems that Nathan was left at the spot that he was found, but he didn't necessarily die there. At this point, police have noted that there isn't any evidence of foul play, which confuses me a little bit, but this is still an ongoing investigation. If you have any information at all, please contact the BRPD's Missing Persons Unit at 225-389-3853. I want to talk about one of the most uncomfortable movies I've seen this year, because it's based on the real-life story of the 34-year-old teacher who groomed and preyed upon her 12-year-old student. And I want to show you a particularly disturbing part where the movie mirrors real life. And just a heads up, this is a very sensitive subject, but I cover a lot of stuff on this page for people with dark curiosities, so follow along. So the movie I'm talking about is called May December. It's on Netflix. And in it, Julianne Moore plays a woman named Gracie who met her current husband when he was just 12 years old and she was his 34-year-old teacher. And this is all based on the case of Mary Kay Letourneau, who did the exact same thing. Letourneau was sent to jail for three months after she became pregnant with 13-year-old Billy Falau's child. She was ordered to never make contact with Billy again, but shortly after she was released, the two were seen together. And then she spent over seven years in jail where she gave birth to their second child. And upon release, the two married. And years later, the two gave a really upsetting interview where Mary said this. No, but I don't need to know him in this discussion. He's the child. I'm talking about you. 
Who was the boss? Who was the boss? What? Who was the boss back then? You know, there was me pursuing you. Who was the boss back then? It's upsetting to watch Mary basically tell him that it's his fault all this happened, but the movie mirrors this in a really interesting way. I'm saying, what if I was too young? The worst part in all this is Mary never thought she did anything wrong. She insists that the rules were different back then and that it was only grooming if it was an adult man doing it to a small girl. And when the interviewer specifically asks her if she was a P word, she says this. Because he wasn't prepubescent, he wasn't a child and we have- Anyways, it's very upsetting, but if you can stomach it, the movie does a great job of getting into the little nuances of a relationship like that and I thought it was fascinating. This is the snow incident, one of the worst ways somebody has ever died explained. This is 12-year-old Josh Demarest, and he lived in New York with his family. One day, Josh was outside playing with his 12-year-old friend Tyler. It was a snowy day, and as we all did when we were younger, they decided to build a snow fort. And many witnesses saw them playing in the snow. And then they both went missing. Nobody could find them anywhere. So the police were called, and they began to search the area. They used canine dogs to try and get the scent of the young boys. They then found footprints leading to a particular snow pile. And when they got to that snow pile, they saw a sled sticking out of it. So everybody at the scene began digging crazy at the snow pile. Everybody was completely freaking out thinking the worst, and the worst happened. The snow was tightly packed, but they eventually found Josh and Tyler. Both of them were completely buried in the snow, and then they were taken to the hospital. Tyler did have hypothermia, but he did survive. But sadly, Joshua would die. So, what happened? Well, when the two boys were building their snow fort, they heard a dump truck backing up, making that beeping noise over and over. And Tyler said at that point, everything just went completely black. The drivers of the truck were working on this snow pile that the boys were at, but they never even saw them playing. So, they were buried alive under several feet of tightly packed snow. Tyler was able to find a small air pocket, which is how he survived. But unfortunately, Joshua was buried face down. And they were buried underneath the snow pile for three whole hours. Joshua's mother was not in town when he died. Because her mother, Joshua's grandmother, died that same exact day. The snowbank where Joshua died was then turned into a temporary memorial. And I just can't believe this happened. This is absolutely horrifying and this is definitely one of the worst ways to go. I feel so bad for Joshua and especially his mother, and may he rest in peace. These four young men were lured to a park in New York City and murdered with machetes, all after being lured there by this woman known as Little Devil. These are the four victims, Justin, Jefferson, Michael, and Jorge. Their ages ranged from 16 to 20 years old, and they were just young men. But at one point, they posted videos of themselves throwing up MS-13 gang symbols on social media. If you don't know MS-13, they're one of the most violent gangs on Earth. And apparently, a woman saw these videos and thought she had to do something about this. This woman was 22-year-old Liniz Escobar, also known by her nickname, La Diablita, or Little Devil. Little Devil, as we're going to call her, was involved in the MS-13 gang. And when she saw those four young men posting videos of them throwing up signs when they weren't in the gang, she informed gang members of what they were doing. They then hatched a brutal and disturbing plan. Lenise, aka Little Devil, hit the boys up on social media and asked them if they wanted to come smoke weed with her in a local park. The boys then headed out to the park on Long Island, and after meeting Little Devil there, they were surprised when a group of MS-13 gang members ambushed them in the woods. In a frenzy of violence, these MS-13 gang members then hacked up the four young men with machetes. This was an extremely gruesome and bloody scene. And according to witnesses, Little Devil was actually splashed with blood throughout this massacre. And according to someone who was watching what she was doing, she licked the blood off of her lips and smiled as these men were macheted to death. The next day, the four young boys' bodies were found bloodied and chopped up in the park. But as it turns out, there were actually five young boys who were all friends invited to the park that day. And one of them, a young man named Elmer Ruiz, actually managed to escape the violence and fled to safety on foot. He was the one who ended up being able to testify against the killers and, yes, against La Diablita. 
Eventually, Liniz Escobar was found guilty on all charges, charges which included murder. And I'm sure that she won't be seeing the daylight of the real world ever again. Well, at least hopefully not. This is the worst video of 2023, and whatever you do, don't go looking for it. The video that I'm about to explain has little to no backstory, though it's assumed the act committed in this video was fueled by mental illness. That's if the video is real, but it does indeed look legit. The video is short, coming in at 32 seconds in length. There's no clues at all regarding to what country the video comes from, but I'd assume it's from a western country, maybe America. As you play the video, you see a man dressed in female clothing and he appears to be wearing a pink skirt and blouse. He has the skirt pulled down, exposing his genitals. In his left hand, he is carrying a power tool that has been turned on, and it's a rotary circular saw. In his right hand, he holds his manhood as he holds the saw in the other. The blade screeches as the man in the video slowly moves the blade closer to his genitals, and it's clear what he's about to do. He takes a while and braces himself before he goes through with this act. The blade is extremely close to his manhood before he eventually takes the spinning blade and cuts it into his own manhood. Blood sprays everywhere and it completely covers the man's left thigh and the table he is standing next to. In a matter of seconds, he completely slices off his manhood. He then throws it on the table and takes a few seconds to collect himself. He then turns off the rotating saw and there is a lot of blood. You hear the man breathing very heavily due to shock. And after a few seconds, the man reaches down and picks up his own severed manhood and briefly shows it to the camera. It's truly a disturbing sight you don't want to see. The man then picks up a jar and places his own severed manhood inside of it before sealing it off and the video then concludes. This video really made me sick to my stomach and I'm really hoping it's fake, like the BME Pain Olympic videos back in the day, but this video just looked too real. It's very clear this man was extremely unwell mentally and what would drive somebody to do this to themselves blows my mind and it's extremely difficult to wrap my head around it and understand it. I'm telling you right now, do not go looking for this video. It's honestly not worth it. This woman was famous for her superpowers, but was then accused of killing her daughter. Christina Boyer, known as Tina, had a difficult childhood. Her mother had addiction issues, so she placed Tina into foster care. When she was 12, one of her foster brothers actually started SAing her, and she said that her foster parents turned a blind eye to this. Two years later, Tina started noticing that strange things were happening. She said plates, chairs, and other objects would all move on their own around her. This happened particularly when she was angry or upset. Journalists started dubbing her the Columbus Poltergeist Kid, and the media and paranormal investigators became fascinated with her story. Parapsychologist Bill Roll actually moved into her home, and he said that it was one of the most convincing cases of poltergeist activity that he'd ever seen. At age 16, Tina eloped with a man called James Bennett, who unfortunately began to severely abuse her. He beat her, awed her, and tracked her down when she tried to run away. She ended up in hospital with stress and an eating disorder. While she was in hospital, she discovered she was pregnant. Her daughter Amber was born in 1988. Unfortunately, her second husband Larry also turned out to be abusive. She decided to leave him when he was sent to prison and started seeing a man called David Herrin. On April the 14th, 1992, something horrific happened. Her now three-year-old daughter, Amber, was described as quite a hyperactive child and she always had bumps and bruises. The days prior, she actually hit her head on a curb. On the day in question, Tina went to work and David was actually babysitting for her. When she returned, David was in the driveway exclaiming that he couldn't wake up Amber. Tina said that she ran into the trailer and found Amber looking grey. They rushed her to hospital, but she tragically passed away. Tina was arrested and the police suspected that David and Tina had been covering up abuse. Prosecutors would later argue that if the pair had taken the little girl to hospital sooner, she may have been saved. Tina maintained her innocence and still does to this day, but her lawyer actually convinced her to take an Alford plea, which would avoid the death penalty. Tina remains in prison, but shockingly David was acquitted and sentenced to 20 years for child cruelty. This 10 year old girl was murdered during a therapy session gone wrong. And this story is incredibly disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. This is Candace Newmaker. She was born in 1989 in North Carolina. 
Candace's mother was a teenager when she was born, and her father was extremely abusive, so Candace's life was tough from the get-go. Eventually, Candace was removed from the home for neglect and separated from her sibling by social services, and she was eventually adopted by Jeannie Elizabeth Newmaker. Shortly after she was adopted, Jeannie began taking Candace to a psychiatrist because she apparently carried an attitude with her at home. According to Jeannie, Candace killed her goldfish, she played around with machetes, and she said some really strange things. Eventually, though, after trying therapy and psychiatry for years, Jeannie decided to take matters into her own hands. And in April of 2000, they traveled to Colorado, where Candace was brought to an unlicensed therapist for a two-week intensive attachment therapy session. So Candace had been taken to this therapist for what's called a rebirthing session. In this two-week procedure, it's really kind of hard to explain, but there are multiple people that come in and do this therapy and play these weird roles. But it should be noted that none of the four people that were participating in this therapy were licensed to practice any sort of medicine or therapy. During the second week of treatment, they reached the rebirthing procedure. For this session, young Candace was wrapped up in a flannel sheet with pillows, meant to simulate a womb or a birth and Candace was then told to fight her way out of this tunnel. The thought being that if she could fight her way out, she would become attached to her new adoptive mother. However, obviously this didn't work. Four adults weighing over 673 pounds between them were holding down 10 year old Candace. And these adults used their hands to push down on Candace's head, her chest and her entire body. Now during this session, Candace began to scream and complain that she couldn't breathe. And because this was recorded, we know that Candace told the adults that she was dying 11 times. And at one point, one of the women working there named Julie Ponder told Candace, go ahead and die. Die right now, for real, for real. 40 minutes into this session, Candace was asked by one of these workers if she wanted to be reborn. Candace then told her the word no, and this would be Candace's final word. After hearing Candace say no, a woman participating in the session named Julie Ponder began screaming at Candace that she was a quitter. According to the transcript, she yelled, quitter, quitter, quit. Eventually, one by one, the people in the room were asked to leave, including Candace's adopted mother, Jeannie. Eventually, only two people were left in the room, and they were still hoping that Candace would crawl her way out of the tunnel. But after a few minutes, they unwrapped the blanket and discovered that Candace was laying there blue and motionless. She was covered in her own vomit and was blue. Paramedics were called to the scene. They were able to restore Candace's pulse briefly, but she would die soon afterwards. A year later, two of the people involved in this entire thing would be sentenced to 16 years in prison after being convicted of reckless child abuse resulting in death. Sadly, though, no prison sentence is ever going to bring Candace back to this earth. And this story is just downright disturbing. One of you is going to end up dead. This is the chilling statement that friends of this couple made prior to a horrifying turn of events. On the 25th of March 2022, 24-year-old OnlyFans model Abigail White killed her boyfriend. She stabbed Bradley Lewis through the heart with a kitchen knife when he told her he wanted to finish the relationship. When police arrived at the scene, she actually tried to tell them that he'd done this to himself, but she quickly confessed. She said that she'd never meant to hurt him. Abigail was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 18 years in prison. Shockingly, despite being in prison, she has been able to find a new boyfriend on the outside. There has been an absolutely horrific murder this week that was live streamed on Instagram. This case is extremely disturbing, so please be warned before watching. On Friday, 12,000 people watched a Bosnian bodybuilder kill his wife on Instagram Live. 35-year-old Nermin had been abusing his wife during their marriage and the pair had a young child. On Friday morning, he took to Instagram Live to tell his followers that they could witness a live killing. Absolutely horrifically, he turns the camera to his ex whose face is completely covered in blood and disfigured. He calls her a derogatory name and blames her for her own death because she reported him to police. Disturbingly, you can hear the child crying in the background. He then tells his followers that he's the child's father and his ex had hidden the toddler from him for over a week and reported him to police for DV. So in my opinion, yes, she's taking steps to keep her and her child safe from you. 
After shooting his wife in the head on Instagram, he then goads his followers saying, someone come and save the child. A police chase then began and he went on a shooting rampage. He continued to film and tells his viewers that he's killed two other people who actually turned out to be an innocent man and his young son. He also wounded a police officer, another man and a woman while on the run. He ended up unaliving himself on the same day. This is Jared Fogle, one of the worst pedophiles in American history. So if you don't know who Jared Fogle was, he was the spokesperson for Subway for a number of years. Jared initially became famous and then eventually became the spokesman of Subway because he dropped so much weight while eating a Subway diet. According to Jared, he lost almost 245 pounds while eating almost exclusively from Subway. Obviously, this was a huge story and when Subway heard about this, they contacted Jared and eventually made him the spokesman for their entire company. I swear to God, I remember this. For years, you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing this guy's face. So in 2004, when Jared was at the height of his popularity, he launched the Jared Foundation, a foundation determined to fight childhood obesity. This foundation saw Jared touring schools across the nation, talking to kids about losing weight, and yeah, just being heavily involved with children, which people at the time thought was a great thing. But it was when he was away from the cameras, behind the scenes, when Jared was engaging in some of the most deplorable behavior I've ever read about. So in 2007, a radio host and journalist from Florida came forward to the FBI and reported that Jared was saying and doing some concerning things. Apparently, while at a middle school event, Jared had been talking to her about performing lewd acts on a minor. He had texted her about all of these things, and she even recorded him saying all this stuff. At one point, apparently, Jared even asked this journalist if she could install webcams in her children's bedrooms so he could watch them. Obviously, this was concerning. This journalist recorded all of this, turned it into the FBI, but they told her that they couldn't do anything because they didn't have enough evidence. And now we got to talk about Russell Taylor, a guy who was heavily involved in Jared's foundation. So when he wasn't working on the Children's Foundation, this guy, Russell Taylor, was producing CP in his home. Apparently, between the years 2011 and 2015, Russell Taylor had videotaped minors in his own home and traded photographs of them with none other than, you guessed it, Jared Fogle, King of the Footlong. According to court documents, Jared actually asked Russell if he could move some of the nanny cams in his home so he could watch children in varying states of undress or while they were naked taking a bath. Russell also claimed that Jared made him set up accounts on porn sites in his name and he wanted to basically run his whole CP operation for him. Well, shortly after Russell Taylor was arrested, Jared Fogel's home was raided and guess what they found? A ton of CP. On the same day that his home was raided, Subway severed all ties with Jared and some new disturbing facts came to light during the trial. Apparently years prior, Jared had been texting a Subway franchisee named Cindy. And over these texts, he talked about wanting to abuse kids aged nine to 16. He told Cindy she should sell herself for sex on Craigslist and even asked her to arrange a sexual meetup between him and her 16 year old cousin. Eventually, Jared pled guilty to possession of CP and traveling to conduct an illicit sexual behavior with a minor. Apparently while in New York City, he paid to have sex with a 17 year old girl. But this story isn't over yet. I'm gonna post part two and it definitely gets more interesting from here on out. This case made me terrified to go to the cinema. This is the case of the horror in screen nine. James Holmes was raised in California. His mum was a nurse and his dad was a scientist. From a young age, he was experiencing night terrors and allegedly actually tried to take his own life when he was just 11 years old. He was apparently obsessed with guns and weapons and had dreamed of becoming a mass murderer. Between May and July 2012, he legally bought four guns. Background checks were conducted and he was allowed the weapons. He also bought spike strips, which if you don't know, pop the tires of cars if they chase after you. On July the 19th, just hours before tragedy would unfold, James mailed his notebook to his psychiatrist. Inside the notebook, James detailed his plans to kill. The notebook was actually discovered later on undelivered. Just prior to entering a cinema in Aurora, James rang a crisis line to tell them about his plans to kill. However, the call was disconnected after just nine seconds. At the midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises, CCTV captures James walking into the cinema. He walks into screen nine, props open the door and then walks back out again. Shockingly, he goes to his car and gets guns out and gas canisters. He re-entered the screen at about 12.38 p.m. and set off two gas canisters. When he entered screen nine again, he immediately opens fire on the audience, instantly killing 10 people. Two others later died in hospital from their injuries. An additional 70 people were injured. This was an absolutely packed out cinema. 
James also shot at people as they scrambled to exit the screen. His youngest victim was a six-year-old girl. Witnesses said this all unfolded as there was actually a gunfight on the screen and initially they all thought it was special effects and just part of the film. Police were actually on the scene very quickly after the first 911 call. James surrendered to the police and was arrested in the car park. He was apparently very, very calm when he was arrested and told police that he had booby-trapped his apartment. When police investigated his apartment, this was found out to be true. He was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, did not act alone. This TikTok series is about to blow your mind, but there's a lot of information here, so proceed with caution. The case of John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer clown, is one of the most infamous true crime stories in American history. A brief overview of the case, in the 1970s, John Wayne Gacy murdered 33 young men. He buried them in the crawl space beneath his home and his yard, and he was connected to a number of different crimes. Gacy himself gained infamy because he dressed up as Pogo the Clown on the weekends and volunteered at hospitals and children's birthday parties. Now, the official story says that John Wayne Gacy acted completely alone. He had no help in carrying out any of these murders, but I really don't believe that that's the case. Through all of our research that we did for our podcast, we've determined that Gacy was connected to a number of other killers, pedophiles across America. And he even may have been connected to one of America's other most infamous serial killers, the Candyman out of Houston, Texas. So before we get into this, I want to state that I do believe that Gacy did murder some people, and I think he was very complicit in all of this, obviously, but I don't think that he acted alone. But why do I think that? So to start off, we need to talk about Jeffrey Rignall, this guy who was actually a survivor of John Wayne Gacy. After a night of abuse and essay at the hands of John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Rignall was allowed to go free. But what Jeffrey would go on to tell authorities and the media about what happened that night at Gacy's home is a major thing in this whole conspiracy. Now, Jeffrey would tell the police that while Gacy was essaying him, there was another man in the room. Now, whether or not this other man participated in the essaying or they were there to watch, it doesn't matter. Someone was watching this criminal act occur. He knew he could give a description of the guy, and he knew that someone else was there watching this happen. Then we get to Robert Bob Gilroy, who was a victim of John Wayne Gacy. So Robert Gilroy was abducted on September 15th, 1977. That's the official date that he went missing. He was supposed to show up for an event after that day, but he never showed. But John Wayne Gacy's plane tickets and records placed him as being out of the state at the time. His plane tickets from the time show that Gacy left Illinois on September 12th, and he didn't return until September 16th, the day after Robert Gilroy went missing. Already, these two facts point to a larger conspiracy at hand. There may have been people helping procure victims for Gacy, and he may have been even paying for these victims. And that's when we get to Philip Paskey and John David Norman, two of the most horrific people I've ever read about. And this is where the connections with the case start to get really shocking. And we've talked about John David Norman here on my TikTok before. This guy was connected with the higher ups in the government. This guy had lots of political power, and he was a known pedophile. Remember, in earlier TikToks, I even told you about how John David Norman was arrested multiple times. He had Rolodexes full of index cards of the people who he was supplying these young men to. And both times, the police departments lost the Rolodexes and lost all the names of the abusers. But how did they connect to Gacy? Well, in part two, we're going to talk about it. This mysterious case absolutely does not sit right with me. Someone knows something and has not come forward. On the 12th of July 2015, 18-year-old Tiffany and her parents attended a graduation party in New Jersey. At around 9pm, one of Tiffany's friends spoke to her parents and claimed that they were really annoyed because Tiffany had used their debit card without permission. Tiffany initially denied this to her friend, but then did admit this to her mum Diane a little bit later. At this point, they were all outside Tiffany's house and Diane went inside to find her husband. When she returned outside of the house, Tiffany had vanished. Now they were able to see Tiffany on the deer cameras that they had outside the house. She appears to be walking down the driveway in her normal clothing and white headband. When they tried to find Tiffany, they actually made a terrifying discovery. Her phone was lying on the floor at the bottom of the driveway. Immediately they knew something was wrong as Tiffany never had her phone out of her sight. At 11.30 p.m. her family called the police. Little did they know 27 minutes earlier, Tiffany had been hit by a train. Frustratingly, pretty much straight away, police presumed this death to be a self-unaliving. However, that just didn't seem to fit with the evidence presented. All of Tiffany's family and friends said how much of an upbeat person she was and that she was really happy at the time. 
She was making plans for the future and the autopsy also showed that she had a clean toxicology report. Now in the deer cam footage, she was fully clothed, but when she was found, she was just in her underwear with no shoes on. Upsettingly, two weeks after her death, Tiffany's mum actually found her missing trainers and headband more than a mile away from the track. Could someone have murdered Tiffany and then dumped her body on the train tracks to make it look like she did this herself? Tiffany's parents certainly think so. They definitely suspect some foul play was involved. This pedophile was so terrible that when he was released from prison, they actually put out a public safety warning, warning people to stay away from this guy. This is James Alfred Cooper, who Canadian officials nicknamed the worst pedophile in Canadian history. So back in 1903, James was convicted of the brutal essays and torture of six children in Canada. And apparently he had used a number of torture devices to keep these kids from talking. He had used a cat o' nine tails, a cow whip, a cattle prod, belts and sticks. I mean, six victims, they all went through so much and this guy was responsible for all of it. James's background is shrouded in mystery. Nobody knows too much about what he went through as a kid, but he was convicted of assault when he was 22 years old back in 1958. And years later, his criminal career started out with burglary. So at first, when he would break into houses, he would just steal things for the thrill of it. He would take family photos. He would take fridge magnets, items from the kitchen. But that evolved into him wanting to wake up the people that he was robbing. He would stand over these people's beds, wake them up violently in the middle of the night, and then escape out of a window or through the door that he broke in through. But that involved into a desire to SA people inside of their own homes. At one point, he essayed a minor in their own home at knife point after waking them up in the middle of the night. He also did the same thing to a single mother while holding her at knife point. I mean, this guy was terrible and it would only get worse. At one point though, he married a woman named Patricia who already had three kids. He would eventually have another child with her. And this is when the abuse of children began. And this is when the abuse really started. He would use these horrific tools to actually torture and abuse the children that were living under his own roof. And he did these mind games with the kids. He even made them eat things like their own excrement out of their pants while everybody in the house watched. I mean, this guy was sick and twisted. I mean, there's so much to the story that is so graphic and disturbing that I cannot talk about it here on TikTok. If you want to look it up, there's a great article online that explains this whole case and it's, it's just really hard to get through. But he would even do things like buy tubs of ice cream, rub it on his body and make his children lick it off of him. He even at one point invited a neighborhood girl over with one of his own children and he essayed both of them. Keep in mind this whole time he was also physically abusing the children, beating them, he was verbally abusing them. He was just the worst person. I can't even get that across how bad of a guy this dude was. Eventually though, in 1987, he finally was arrested and charged with doing all of these horrible things. Eventually DNA would link him to some of the break-ins that he had committed as well and the assaults that he had committed during those break-ins. And at the time he was given a 30 year sentence. Now that doesn't sound like very much, but in Canada, that was the longest sentence ever given in Canadian history for crimes like this. But unfortunately, with Canada's laws, this meant that he didn't have to serve that much time for what he had done to his own children, to all of these kids for so many years, to all the random people he had uh, victimized during the break-ins. And in 2012, he was allowed to walk free from prison after only serving 21 years. He was paroled out. And that's what led the Toronto Police Department, like I said at the beginning, to release a public safety warning, warning people that this guy was out of prison, he was walking amongst them, and that they didn't know what he was gonna do next. So at the end of the day, if his sentences would have been imposed consecutively instead of concurrently, he would have been in prison for 180 years, meaning he would have died in prison. But since they don't do that in Canada, he only ended up serving those 21 years. Now there is a little silver lining. Shortly after his release, he was re-arrested for breaking the terms of his parole. And at the time he was on chemical castration drugs. He was actually urging his doctor to give him less of them. But since he was a first time offender, as they called him back in 93 when he was sentenced, he was released shortly after violating the terms of his parole. And once again, he is somewhere out in Canadian society doing God knows what. I just thought I should make this TikTok to let you guys know that he is out there and He's dangerous. He is a terrible human being. I'm, I'm urging you, if you want to read more about this case, to look up the news article. It is one of the most disgusting things I've ever read. And yeah, this guy is really worst of the worst. I, I can't think of a worse individual than this guy.